This is the Total Human Optimization Podcast, the show that explores how to become the best version of yourself. We go in depth with experts in fitness, nutrition, and well being to examine new ideas and time tested strategies that can help you on the path to optimization. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Total Human Optimization Podcast. Today, we got a couple of jack dudes in the house, Mr. John Russin and Christian Tributo. What's up, guys? What's going on, dude? It's great to be here. We've been here at Onnit for a couple of days, and this is like the kickoff to our trip. Right on. Uh, personally, I'd like to thank like the Onnit gang for feeding me bars for the whole weekend, so I'm <laughs> feeling pretty awesome right now. Bars and Alpha Brain, right? Yeah, I don't know in, in which order. <laughs> I think Christian set a record for the most oat mega bars eaten over the course of oh, the man. weekend. Dude, you must have been flying all over the gym, dude. Those things, they gassed me up really good. I don't know about you guys. I was actually flying all over the gym, but also all over the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. They taste really, really good, but I just know that an hour later, it's going to just be a fucking fart fest. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Wow, so it's so good to have you guys here. You guys were here at the Onnit Academy doing a, a certification, right? So how did that go? Did you guys teach some people some shit or what? Yeah, it was good. Uh, you know, it was Easter weekend and it was also tax weekend, but we had about 20 plus coaches come out for the two-day seminar and it was really well received. You know, like we had a lot of great feedback and coach Chris and I, you know, we just started this up a couple months ago. So this is some brand new content that we really haven't even written articles about yet. So it's always interesting to see the kind of responses that we get from people when it's brand new stuff, because between Chris and I, we have thousands of articles that people can read. And as soon as we bring something new to the table, people are like, whoa, okay. So it was, it was really good weekend. I was really pleased with it. And the cool thing is that personally, I, uh, even though like I've been coaching for a long time and, and I know the material, of course, because John and I work together on it, I, I still learn new stuff. Uh, what I really enjoy is when we get up and coach somebody together because uh, we basically teach the same things, but different ways. So I'm actually learning new cues, new way to approach the big lift, the big compound movement. So uh, I'm actually getting better a, as a coach and human being from working with this guy. Awesome. So you guys mentioned you guys read a ton of articles and I've seen, I've seen the blogs before. You're, you're no doubt are doing that for sure. So, <laughs> but it's awesome to me because like you guys are jack dudes and you guys are sitting at the computer typing away, <laughs> making articles, you know, I don't know, like Starbucks or something. Who knows? But I mean, were you guys always these kind of dudes? Were you like nerds like, like me, like a, a scrawny nerd early in the early days and then just something clicked and you know, you just found out the right way to get jacked? I never wrote an article before four years ago. And I was just a coach. I was an athlete growing up and I sucked at English. Like, I, I think well, I was like, a, I'm French Canadian. So I <laughs> can bet that my English is worse than yours. Yeah, yeah, you I was a couple a levels alibi. above Chris's, but <laughs> it, it came to the point where uh, I was reading so much and I was doing so much self-study after graduate school when I was coaching. My wife's like, well, fuck it. Why don't you just start writing some articles? So the first one took me a couple of weeks to write and then I sent it in and then one after another started happening. And now, you know, five, 600 articles later that have been published in big media, uh, it's crazy to see. But it was like a hidden talent that I thought I had because I just know coaching people. And uh, I guess I can write a little bit too, I found out. And personally, I think that I was probably much worse of a geek than you are. <laughs> uh, what, what, what people don't know is that I, I'm actually Asperger. So when I was a kid, of course, I didn't know it at the time, but and I never blended in. Uh, I was really always introverted, always, uh, it, it, always writing stuff, learning new stuff and I was like not really connected with the world uh, actually for me like playing sport which I was really bad at uh, was a way uh, to gain validation and that's actually why I started training I was really bad at sports but I needed to fit in so I, I, I thought well if I'm good at sport I'm going to fit in better so I started researching training I was like researching training when I was something like 10 years old I remember I was reading Bill Pearl's book um, just because I had that strong need to be part of something uh, but I, I still am I'm still uh, I'm still a geek. I'm still a nerd, but I just have no uh, no skill when it comes to technology or anything. So I I, I guess that that is uh, something I don't have. But I, deep down inside, I still have the personality that I had back then. I think it's super important to know, you know, too, like 
you know, uh, John and Chris have been in, in this industry a long time. And, uh, you know, you know, John obviously being a chiropractor or sorry, physical therapist. Oh, and, that, that, oh that was a bad I know, one. Uh, a low blow. I know. Wow. Well, I'm I mean, I, no. wish, wish, wishful thinking. <laughs> no. I, I'm a stripper person. <laughs> Aren't we all? But, you know, true mastery is the ability to take really complex things and make them so simple. And something, you know, I've been reading from you guys for a number of years now and, and how all the experience that you guys have accumulated you know, whether it's training your bench press or your squat or your deadlift, but it's been so digestible for multiple formats of people, whether you're the trainer that's fresh into the industry, that's never trained a client and you're doing it as an end user, or you're doing it for a collegiate coach and they're looking to learn a little bit deeper systems uh, to maximize their clientele. So that's one of the hardest things to do, though, is to try to make your information widespread. Because many coaches in the industry, they, they're so niched off that they only speak to a high-end professional or they only speak to an end consumer, which would be like an athlete or a client in the gym. But I think uh, where Chris and I gain some popularity with our content is that we take highly complex uh, methods and systems and we make it uh, digestible for everybody. And it's something that, you know, I get a lot of emails and a lot of calls after we write some of the bigger articles on T Nation, for instance, from other coaches. But then I get emails from people that are just, you know, like two years into training as well. And I think that if you can have the ability to do both of those things, like your, your spread is just so wide. You know, I think that the big problem is that most coaches who want to be known as expert, right? <laughs> they teach to look smart. Yeah. Instead of teaching to help people, people get better. So, so if I have one advice to people who want to get in like the article writing industry or seminar industry, stop trying to look smart. Just try to make other people feel smart. That is probably the best advice I can give people. You will not look smarter if you use words that you can barely pronounce, right? Just make something complex sound simple and people, you will win them over. I think even worse than that is like the PubMed guys that mm. like will go in and they don't know anything in practicality about a training method, but I just cited four studies so I look yeah. smart. There's nothing worse than superficial knowledge yep. on a topic and <laughs> thinking that it allows you to know everything. Yeah. So that, that brings up another point. Like, you know, people get into these things and, you know, if you're a beginner, if you're somebody that, that, that doesn't know where to start and you start reading these articles and you want to start getting into it, it's really intimidating. You know, and then you have these other side of the, of the people like, like you're mentioning like the WebMD guys or whatever it is, you know, that they're telling you you should do this. And then you're telling you that you're telling them they should do this and they get confused. And then some might just not even go further than that. We talked about this in the seminar uh, yesterday is that people are going to inherently gravitate towards their personality profiles and their neurological profiles. But if you have zero experience training and you don't even know what's out there, it's going to be really hard to gravitate towards the right thing. So I always recommend that people go down the rabbit hole on like one expert at a time. So for instance, like I'm new to training, I'm going to read all of Chris's articles. I'm going to figure out which training system I can use for a 12 to 24 week period and then evaluate it. Like what did I like? What did I not like? What did I get results from? And then you can go from there, but you can't just be jumping all over the place because there is just so much information out there. You know, there's good information, there's bad information, there's really dangerous information. But I think if you find a credible source, somebody that has an educational background, but they also have real world uh, science behind the types of results that they're getting with their clients, I think that's like kind of the, the perfect synergy. Yeah, especially since when you consider it, many, many of our concepts are concepts brought on by other coaches. They might not like make scientific sense if you just look at the literature, but you try it in real life and it works. So if, you, if that happens, you can push it a bit further to really understand why does it work? And then from then on, you can actually make better decisions. Because if you just go with the superficial knowledge of what should be working, you probably are missing out on many, many good things. Uh, so I think it's really important to accumulate an experience. And the same thing could be said with coaches. I mean, how many coaches want to get into the lucrative online coaching business and they have never trained actual live clients, right? Now, I, I, I've trained well over a thousand people in my life, uh, Olympic athletes, pro athletes, average Joes. And, and I'm just starting out doing online coaching with like something like 20 people. I, I want to live in myself and it's hard. I'm yeah. having a hard time. So, and you have, you see these Instagram kids who have never trained anybody <laughs> and they have like 200 clients. No, it's because they're showing their ass, dude. They're, they're, <laughs> well, I can show my know. ass if you want. <laughs> That, that, that's what it's all about. Yeah, well, I have, I'm, I'm quads dominant, so I basically have no glutes, and that will not get a huge following. So I, I get a ton of inquiries here at the Ana Academy in terms of, 
oh man, I love on it and everything you guys are doing. And I didn't realize that you guys had a certification. Where do I start? You know, and do I get my NASM? Do I go train at my house? Do I train at a Gold's gym? Do I train at a, uh, a performance facility? You know, for you guys having been in this industry before the Instagram, Facebook wave, you know, what, what is a great place for a young trainer to start? Volunteer. Yeah, that's what I did for the first two years when I, I, I would coach for free because at the time, uh, I wouldn't work with athletes, but of course, a pro athlete or a high-level athlete will not hire someone without experience. So I volunteered with young figure skaters, like 9, 10, 12, 15 years old. And then from then on, I started working with young hockey players. For the first two years, I didn't get a single paycheck, but that gave me enough experience and confidence to eventually get, get more contracts. So some of these hockey players became professional, so that gave me credibility to get more athletes. Some of these figure skaters went to the Olympics or World Championships. So, so there is nothing wrong with uh, doing very little money for a short time. It just gained experience, basically. I used to go uh, when I was 16, 17, and 18, so a sophomore through a senior in high school. I used to go over to the University of Buffalo, and I used to volunteer my time for three hours a night. And I used to see the baseball team getting trained, the basketball team, and the football team for three years, like multiple times a week. And guess what? Fast forward like six years, I actually got a job working at that exact same weight room. And that was the thing that really sparked me from there. But it doesn't, you, you need to learn. You need to learn from people. And again, you need to experience different systems so you know what works and what doesn't work. And you can gain your knowledge base from there. And you also need to experience as many different people as possible. Mm -hmm. Because as we saw in the seminar this weekend, it's all about finding the best way to work with different types of people. Either with body types, you have to change the exercise. You might have to scale down some movement patterns, but also with psychological profile. Some people respond great to some type of coaching, but the other people might be turned off by that same coaching. Uh, same thing with training methods. Some training methods work better with some people than others. So if you never work with a wide range of individuals, then you will always coach people as if it were yourself. That's the big problem with coaches. They, they coach everybody as if they were themselves. And the problem is that they aren't all of yourself. So, so if when I started out, I made that mistake. So I was really good at, at training short, fat, introverted people because that's what I was. So, <laughs> hey, hey, uh, well, when's your next uh, appointment available? <laughs> So yeah, so when I had like the, the the taller, like more extroverted people, I had real problems. So eventually, you learn when working with like a wide range of individuals that you can't always train in the same way. If you don't have the experience, I can you know that it's impossible. That, that's what's really novel about this neurological profile system, though, because when you think about the best coaches in the world over the last fifty years, usually they're very good communicators and they're good readers of people. Yeah. And then you think about that as just the gut instinct of giving an athlete what they need in the weight room or on the field or court. And we put a system to it to have people learning how to become that gut-based coach. And that is a powerful thing when you look at uh, making sure that your athletes or your clients don't fall through the cracks, which is a big problem in our industry. Yeah. So, you know, getting into the, into the, like, the training aspect of things and, and all the different terms there are, there's terms for everything, right? And one of the most popular ones that, that we've you know, kind of harness here at on is the word functional. Well, we're not talking about only old school dogmatic bodybuilding here. We are talking about an eclectic approach to gaining muscle, burning fat, and being a resilient athlete. So when I look at functional hypertrophy training, we're going to take the best of powerlifting, athletic performance, bodybuilding, and mesh those things together. So the synergy effect is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. So really, uh, it's a lot of the stuff that I've been doing over the last 10 years with my high performance athletes, and we've just systemized it in a way that we actually sell as a 12-week program now, and we have been doing that for about 18 months. But we look at it as just a really well-rounded program that takes my background and my experiences in the world of physical therapy, high-end athletic performance, uh, aesthetics-based uh, performance, and then also powerlifting, and we put it all together in a mosh posh program to try to achieve world-class results for people. So functional training, to me, it's really simple. Functional is about moving better and pain-free. That, that's what it's all about. And having more muscle is not necessarily going against that. In fact, if you have more muscle and you practice utilizing that muscle to move better, then it actually becomes functional because it's like a car. If I have a, a car with a bigger engine, technically, it can actually run faster. 
But if I don't know how to drive it, then I can't control that bigger engine and I have problems. So, so what we're talking about is we are using like muscle building methods to increase the, the, the size of the engine, but we are practicing movements to learn to apply that increased power to basic movement pattern and, and moving. We're trying to break the myth of like the old school bodybuilder that just moves like shit mm -hmm. and he's in chronic pain all the time. Like that's the myth that we're trying to bust here because we're trying to be just a little bit smarter with the way that we're programming things. We're looking at pain-free methodologies and we're actually preparing and recovering like athletes instead of just going in and worried about aesthetics only. Anyway, that's where it's at most. But what, I think that's one of the reasons why CrossFit is becoming popular, right? People want to feel like they're athletes. I'm not saying that CrossFit is the best way to do it because the injury rate is pretty high because many of these movement patterns, people are not ready to do them. But they really want to feel like they're accomplishing something. They want to feel like an athlete. So that's the system we have. It's basically we get you that athletic field because we train people like if they were athletes, but you also get the aesthetic uh, improvement from the system. Yeah, I think that's a big thing is like, because the old school bodybuilding technique is, you know, you lift heavy and then you rest, you rest. And if you're for a CrossFit type person, you're bored. <laughs> Man, and that actually goes with the psychological profile. I mean, uh, if, uh, let's say the one profile we mentioned, and that, that, that actually Sam's profile, if you are a novelty seeker. So these people crave, uh, crave high adrenaline, they crave variation, they crave high frequency. So if you have them train like four days a week, super high volume, and then rest, it actually kills their motivation to train. If you always have them on the exact same muscle building program, it also kills their motivation. So you have to find a way to make the training fit the psychological and physiological profile of the person to get maximum results. So, and I think that that is the true future of training. Individualization is what's important. The problem is that most coaches are lazy, right? I mean, you have the highly professional coaches. You have highly professional coaches who go to courses, go to certification, wants to better themselves. When they, when they are with their clients, they are 100% intellectually involved on every single rep. They don't talk about their weekend talk on their cell phone. They are actually looking at their athlete move. They, they are looking at their facial expression. So they are gathering, as John says, data to learn as much as possible to give the better feedback possible. Now, that is what we're about, like learning being intellectually involved and giving the best service to the client. But most people are lazy. They just give the same training program to everybody because it's less work. They could be cut and paste programs. They don't coach in a gym. They just count reps. So that will kill the industry or make it revive because these people will go away for if the, per, the professional trainers, those who are really, really eager to learn, overcome these people. And I think they should. Yeah. And I was also thinking the other day is like, Part of these certification courses should also be photography courses because now everybody <laughs> wants to be filmed on Instagram yeah. for yeah. every single new video. So you guys need to have like a photography course, and oh. he's not he's not very happy about that. I, I, I'm the guy who <laughs> hates picture the most. I, mean, like, <laughs> oh. I think too, as you look at you know, a lot of our listeners are going to go, well, you know, John and Chris are, are world renowned coaches with a lot of power uh, power lifters and Olympic lifters and professional athletes, and then you look at a lot of the stuff that on it does and clubs and maces and kettlebells and this quote unquote unconventional training. But, you know, as we've all talked all weekend is it's not just about like, well, how big is your back squat? And if you can't back squat 600 pounds, when, then you have no business coaching someone how to back squat. It's, it's a principle system, right? It's, can you move pain free? Can you, can you do it for the longevity of your career? Like it's not six weeks out, right? It's six years out. And what is your resilience? Because total human optimization, which is what our method is here at on it in terms of a brand, it's optimization means something different to each and every athlete, whether you're a power lifter, whether you're a professional hockey player. Just become player. a better version of you. Exactly. I mean, I, I'm 5'8", I'm right? So I'll never be a pro basketball player. <laughs> but I can, if I want, if I like basketball, I can still become better. To me, that would be optimizing my performance. I'll never read, I, I, all right, I like strength, right? But I do have a small structure. So I would never, even when I was at my strongest, I was not a world-class powerlifter. It doesn't mean that I know less than the guys who are squatting a thousand pounds because they are genetically built for it. The big problem with physique and strength is that people don't accept as much that they are individual genetic uh, issues. I mean, if you're born 5'8", it's pretty easy to know that you won't be a basketball player. But everybody think they have what it takes to be a pro bodybuilder. Everybody think, if I train hard enough, I might look like that guy on Instagram. Well, maybe not. But you can become the best version of yourself possible. And that is what optimization is about. 
I think a lot of it comes down to the longevity of somebody's training career. And the way that we prolong somebody's longevity is one, keeping them pain free, and two, keeping their motivation high so we can have consistency. If we can stay consistent over a long period of time, everything is going to be optimized, like you guys are saying. You're going to get better little by little, decade after decade. You know, some of the athletes that I work with, they're in their 50s and their 60s, and they're doing things better than when they did in their 20s and their 30s because they're taking better care of their systems and it's the compound effect of doing the right thing decades at a time. And again, like there's many different ways to go in and program around this kind of stuff, but it's about making sure that your client is happy with the results, they're happy and having fun with their training, they're highly motivated and they can do it for the long haul. So we look about at consistency self-sufficiency so they can do some stuff on their own and they're not just laying slave to a coach, but then you look at the kind of sustainability it has as well. So if your goals aren't sustainable, you know, it's going to be a fizzle out effect. I think that one point that John make it that is really, really important. I believe that many people who th are losing capacity as they're getting older, it's, it's not because they're getting older. It's because they never took care of themselves when they were getting older. So that could mean like bad nutrition. That could mean just abusive behavior. But it could also mean like bad training form that they could get away with when they were younger. But eventually it just piles up, piles up, piles up. And eventually they reach a tipping point where they just can't function anymore. But if you get these people healthier, like working on their inside, but also working on their lifting technique, lifting approach, then they can actually become better than they were. Now, imagine that if you do that with a guy who's like in his 20s or 30s, you, you teach them the right stuff from the start, they will actually be able to improve in their 60s, 70s, no problem at all. You optimize the body, it will stay healthy for much longer. That's my goal as a coach, and that's my goal is when we go out and do these educations or I write an article, is I want to give younger guys and gals the tools to actually start training smarter so they don't reach these roadblocks that I see so many times coming through my facility. I want to make sure that we can make, make them healthy from the get-go so they don't have to deal with pulling themselves out of these huge functional deficits. Yeah, so that, I think that's why in this, in this time of, of age, like, I feel like we have more information than ever. Oh, yeah. Like, especially in the diet uh, part of the thing. So, you know, tell me a little about that, what you, what you guys uh, think on, on that aspect because, you know, going back even even five years, the whole aspects of diet in, in, in how it applies I to your training is Everybody wants completely. to make a quick buck from dieting, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they come up with a, it's really simple, right? With dieting, you have to seduce people. I'm going to give you an example, right? Uh, let's say I have a client that- Are you going to seduce me? Uh, I can. <laughs> I'm, I'm a male stripper, remember? <laughs> Sam Pogue, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, let's say a client comes in my office. Hey, well, Christian, I mean, I have a- um, I have a pool party or like a rave. It actually happened often. Like people, <laughs> I have a rave coming up. Can you help, can you help me put on 20 pounds? No, actually, actually no, it, it, that's probably one of the goal I get the most. When I, when I was like doing a lot of personal coaching, I would get like 10 to 15 of these people every year. I'm getting this big rave party in three months, man. I need to get ripped. Okay, let's go. I'll take your money. But um, <laughs> Only in Quebec City. <laughs> Of course, it's well, Quebec City and Montreal, the like party capital in the world. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's say you have that client. I, I want to get really lean in three months. What should I do? Well, all right. Uh, it's simple, but it's going to be hard, right? You have to cut your carbs as much as possible. No so poutine. You, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so so you, you can't have potatoes. You can't have rice. You obviously can't have pastries. You can't have fruits. I mean, you can only eat meat. You can only eat fish. You can only eat eggs, some nuts, and green veggie. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do that. I have the same client walk in. Hey, Christian, I need to get re re really ripped in three months, right? What can I do? Hey, listen to this, man, all right? It's a new concept. It it's kick-ass. It will get <laughs> you shredded, right? It it right? Listen to this, right? We're going to eat like a caveman, man. Like cavemen <laughs> were ripped. They were like chasing bears yeah. around. They were fighting tigers. Oh, yeah, man, that sounds so Fucking cool. their cousins oh, and yeah. sisters. <laughs> well, it, it worked, right? <laughs> Testosterone, man. Yeah, all exactly. built so, oh, man, that sounds so awesome. What should, well, listen to this, right? You can eat all the meat you want. You can eat all the eggs, fish, poultry you want. You can even eat some almonds and nuts from time to time. And, of course, you can stuff yourself with those green veggies. It's going to look awesome. And, oh, yeah, that's the diet I want to make. That's what I want to do. It's the exact same diet as I just mentioned. But the way you present it, you yeah. seduce people. So people come up with a concept, right? People like to cheat. People like to eat crappy food. So the, the, the current trend now is find a way 
to include crappy food in diet so people will want to follow your diet, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how do you include an egg McMuffin for McDonald's? That's what I'm wondering. Actually, you could. You, I mean, you could because the best advice I actually got regarding dieting was from John. We were actually eating burgers <laughs> and fries at a Montreal restaurant. Yeah. And we were talking about diet. And, and John said, well, you know, diet is simple, right? Just do everything a little bit better. Yeah. I mean, for most people, that's what they should be shooting for. I mean, you're already eating crap pretty much all day long. Well, just do a little bit better. And next week, just do a little bit better. And next week, just a little bit better. And you will see improvement. There's no need for any drastic strategy right now. You will probably not stick with it. Yeah, because then you get stressed out. You get stressed out and stress is the worst thing you can do for your body. The relationship with food, right? The mental state you are in when you eat has a tremendous impact on how you look. If I'm, let's say I'm on a so super severe diet, right? And I just can't owe myself. I eat one donut, only one. It's like 250 calories. It won't make a difference, but I'm stressing so much. I'm screwing my diet. I'm, I'm screwing my diet. Cortisol is going crazy. Cortisol is going up and, and then you're going to like store that as body fat. You can kill metabolic rate, increase water retention. And then you look worse because of the water retention. So you get guilty. Cortisol increases even more. So the relationship with food is w- at least as much responsible for like not improving body composition as the actual food you're eating. So just do things a little bit better. And if you cheat, you know what? Just enjoy it and get back on track afterwards. People get really polarized with diets, even more than they get polarized with training methods, because there's six to 10 times as much information in the dietetic realm as there is in the training realm. If you think about it, not everybody trains, but everyone has to consume food to stay breathing. So when you look at it like that, we really need to be putting a large emphasis on just behavioral change, not these fancy programs, not the dogmatic approaches, but just a little bit better on what you need. Just as we would program differently for somebody coming off of a rotator cuff tear, as we would with somebody that has pure healthy shoulders, we need to be programming the diet and the nutrition strategies around the personality profiles, the neurological profiles, and again, the sustainability. It's really programmed the same as training, but we need to be looking at behavior and sustainability with this stuff. Yeah, the diet strategy without the behavior change will never stick. It will never give you right. long-term results. I mean, you have a, a, a yo-yo diet and it actually hurts your psychological state. You feel bad, you feel depressed, and then you get guilty and you eat more because you feel guilty and you feel bad. So it, it, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, and then you have your cheat day or whatever it is, and then you just go absolutely nuts, eat a whole large pizza and soda. And and I, I once just... gained 26 pounds in six hours, <laughs> honest to God. I actually measured it for the interest of science. <laughs> wow, it must have been a hell of a shit. Well, I, mean, I, 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 can, I can honestly say that the next day I learned the pain of childbirth. <laughs> yeah. That brings up, and there's nothing worse than having a, a terrible shit. I mean, that, I don't mean to get gross, but like you can tell by your shit how well your diet yep. has been. Totally. You either get the mushy mess that mm. makes a mess all over the place, yep. and, and when you get the nice little, all the little clumps that right. just come out. You don't even have to wipe if you right. don't want to. There's nothing worse, like the holy grail of shits, like the ghost <laughs> shit. Like it's like a big bump, <laughs> yeah. and then you try to wipe, and there's nothing there, man. Oh, yeah, you do a cool spot check, that? and there's nothing oh. there. You got a clean bill. Yeah, the, the, wor- the, the worst thing, though, is that when you think you have one of these, or so you don't even wipe, but that's not the case. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so I'm the only one that with whom that happened, right? Ho- hopefully, no one says this is a shitty podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. Um, so Sean Heisen uh, is not here today. He's sick. He didn't take his shroom take immune, but he sent in some <laughs> questions he wanted me to ask. I want to make sure I get some of those in. So he wanted to know about some bodybuilding training, um, how it's always been based more on trial and error and anecdotal evidence than hard science. What are the bodybuilding techniques you know to be the most effective? This is funny that Sean asked this question because I just wrote an article for on it and it was about metabolic stress and he retitled it the pump and then he put a picture in of Arnold so people would kind of get what <laughs> metabolic stress sure. was. But we went through and I think it was like a three, four thousand word article and he was like, all right, cool. Like, uh, can you cite a couple of your studies? And I truly said, like, there's nothing that I that is out there right now that can really talk to what we talked about in this article. And that just goes back to this because really the limitation of research is that it is done in a closed setting. It is done with subjects of you know 10 to 30 people most times. And it is not done in the population that is in front of you as a professional. So there are some really, really big limitations to the research, but I'm a big believer that you have to know the research exists to know what to sift through. And I I joked to him, I said, I would be fucking fired from every single uh, website that I wrote for, every single magazine that I wrote for, if I was writing shit based off the research that was 20 years old. 
people would be like, no, no fucking shit. We knew this 20 years ago. But Chris and I, we try to be uh, slightly ahead of the research. And, you know, being in this industry for a long time now, we now see the research studies coming out from some really good researchers that are based off of the shit that we wrote years ago on T Nation. Yeah, you know, well, one thing uh, I'm known for training methods. I mean, I, I'm not a great programmer. I'm not great at building programs. I, I like to like come up with training methods. And I will tell you one thing, right? When it comes to bodybuilding method, like the, the pump training that we see, it's all interchangeable. It, it is all interchangeable. There is, when we're talking about like pump, traditional bodybuilding training, there is only one thing that's important is creating maximum muscle fatigue. I mean, there was one study, one recent study showing that if you use 30% of your maximum, or if you use 80% of your maximum, if you go to muscle failure, the size gains are exactly the same. There's no difference. So really, when it, when it comes down to building muscle tissue with pump training, all it matters is reaching that point of mus muscle fatigue. Now, in my opinion, right, those bodybuilding methods, drop set, super set, rest pauses, slow tempo, uh, yeah, there, there are some benefit when it comes to mind-muscle connection, but it really is all about finding the method that allows you to push the hardest. For example, myself, if I do sets of 15 to 20 reps, straight reps, I will shoot myself because it's boring. As, But if you have me do like a drop set or a rest pause or like adding partial reps at the end of a set or holding the weight at the end, that's something I can get on board with. So with my psychological profile, it will allow me to get maximum fatigue. So I think that all those methods, if you push them hard, are completely equivalent completely interchangeable. They don't even have to be paradise in the program. You can just throw them whenever you want in the program, but you have to find the one that motivates you the most and that allow you to reach that point of fatigue. I think that's super important. You know, most people who get into fitness and they want to start lifting, it's Monday's International Chess Day, right? And so it's <laughs> bench press, press every day for chess, uh, <laughs> dumbbell bench, flies, what cable machine. Why does and anybody then, love to do chest on Mondays? I don't understand. I All the carbs it. from their yeah. post workout yeah. or post uh, weekend. Well, it's, it's, yeah, because most people don't train on su on Saturday. On Sunday, they feel flat. Yeah. yeah. So if they feel flat, you, you need that big chest pop. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you tell the kid? It's like he's been, he's been doing chest and arms and legs, maybe, uh, and shoulders and then back. And he's been doing that for five, six weeks. And he's like, man, I just, I'm not, my weights aren't going up. I'm not making any changes. Uh, what are, like, what's a piece of advice you can give to the, the novice lifter who's just getting into it? Uh, that they can take away and, and, and not, you know, change a whole, you know, cycle where they have to like go learn a ton of new programs, but that they can make an easy change into their program today. I think you cannot fake base strength. Every world-class bodybuilder came up with a high level of base strength through youth development and early on in their careers. And that's something that it can go into athletic performance. It can enhance your physique. It can enhance your functionality your resilience, that's something that we need to be keen in on, is being strong enough. We don't have to be the strongest. We have to be strong enough to continue to gain the results that we want. That, that is the thing, right? People, they want to get bigger. So instantly, they look at bodybuilding training. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, let, let's take Paul Carter, a good friend of ours. Now, Paul Carter now trains mostly for pump. Like he does like these sets of 25, 30 reps, super set, drop sets, whatever. Uh, and be, oh, it's working, he's jacked now. Well, Paul was always Jack, but Paul was a powerlifter. And Paul not only was super strong, he was a, a, like a motor geek. He really studied the technique of all the big lift. So not only was he strong, he had very efficient technique on the big lift. And people forget that. And if you can do like a lateral raise in perfect form, squeezing the muscle with 30 pounds for 20 reps, of course you're going to build muscle. If I have to use seven pounds, to get the exact same contraction, and I'm not going to build the same hypertrophy because it is about tissue loading. It is about the neurological effect of training. So if you don't have the base strength, those isolation exercises won't work as well because you can't create as much metabolic stress or muscle damage. That's why we put a big found, uh, key on the foundational movement patterns. You know, you talk about the squat, the hip hinge, single leg work like lunges, pushing and pulling at the upper body, and some sort of carrier direct core work. If you can incorporate all of those into your program and you can over a long period of time get stronger little by litter, little linear. Little by litter. Little by litter. <laughs> it's a cat term. Yeah. Like, <laughs> compensatory acceleration training. <laughs> That's how you land on your feet. <laughs> exactly. But if you can do that and then you look out one to two years to 10 years and you are getting better little by little. And yeah. the important thing is that wait, we mentioned that strength is super important and it is, right? But that doesn't mean that you should 
always increase weight on the barbell mm-hmm. at the expense of proper mechanics. Yep. So that's why we emphasize, I mean, uh, for example, at, at the conference, uh, the seminar we gave, I mean, we were both coaching someone. We, we were looking at like five different angles on every <laughs> rep. Each. We're like always moving. I mean, uh, uh, John's wife, Lindsay, was trying to take picture of us coaching, but she couldn't because we're always moving <laughs> look at different angles uh, because we want movement perfection, not only for safety purposes, but to make sure that we are loading the right muscles. So only when you have that kind of like motor efficiency can you really increase loading safely. So it's about getting stronger, but also about building muscle. Now, the one advice I would give to young kids uh, going up is trust the process, all right? Gains will not be immediate. It's perfectly fine if you're not jacked after a month, all right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just, just trust the process. Do things a little bit better every time. Awesome, guys. So we're just about out of time. I know you guys are used to your two, three hour podcast. We like to keep it to, you know, half an hour. But, you know, for the people. We're getting paid the same, right? Uh, no, sorry. Well, you can hand, uh, haggle Sam for that. No. Yeah, you, don't touch me. But, but um, you know, where can people find you and, you know, read more of your articles and, and check your stuff out? Uh, I'm over at drjohnrussin.com, D R J O H N R U S I N.com. Coach Tibbs is over at tibarmy.com, T-H-I-B-A-R-M-Y.com. And we can find us both on t-nation.com. I think we have over a thousand articles between the two of us over there. Awesome. Well, thanks guys so much for stopping by. Really appreciate it. Sam, thanks for filling in for, for Heisen. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you want to listen to past episodes and make sure you get the latest as they are released, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes. Also make sure to visit onit.com, that's O-N-N-I-T.com for the latest in supplementation, foods, and fitness. I'm Orlando Rios. And I'm Sean Heisen. And you've been listening to Total Human Optimization.